uh, are Alex and Aaron, um, PCMI's, uh, the just returned from Africa, and they're going to tell us all about drilling. <laughs> okay. Um, saving the best for last. <laughs> so welcome to Drill Baby Drill, um, water wells in the development context. So like you said, I'm Aaron Kudik. I'm Alex Wolkeman. Um, and we're in the Peace Corps Master's International Program. Um, I served in Tanzania in Peace Corps, and... I was in Senegal. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about logistics and management of well projects, and then Alex is going to take over a little bit later to talk about the actual well drilling. Um, so as a part of my Peace Corps service, I work with this NGO called Safe Well Partners, um, and they work with water projects in the central region of Tanzania. Um, so here's a picture of me and my coworkers. Um, so. Yeah, so as um, my job in Sable Partners, I was a project manager. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about what I learned as a project manager. Um, so <clears throat> I learned that project management is really difficult in developing countries um, for lots of different reasons. But the biggest reasons that I really encountered were cultural differences um, and as you can see, infrastructure differences. Um, so this was a bridge that we had to walk on in order to get to one of our project sites. Obviously not an ideal infrastructure. Um, so I'm going to give a brief overview of um, the project steps that um, my team and I at St. Paul Carpenter went through with communities in order to um, make the project management a little bit less difficult. Um, to make it more likely for a project to succeed. Um, so, first, um, with this NGO, we would have villages, um, village leaders or church leaders in the village call us up and request a site visit. And so, we would go to the site and ask the first question, um, what's the problem? What are the community's needs? And who's the end user? So in this specific village, this woman here is a teacher, um, the headmistress of the primary school, and the well, or the well that was drilled here, uh, was drilled five years ago, and it's been dry for five years. So <laughs> obviously, that's a pretty big problem. Um, in the same village, uh, there's water issues throughout the whole village, um, and the main water source is these two guys that drive around in their little cart um, and have water from a nearby village and they just dump it in other people's buckets with their own buckets. So it's clearly not a safe or clean water source. Um, so it's a pretty big issue. And a uh, school that we went and visited, um, we noticed that all of the girls had to go down to this stream, which is, I think it's pretty obvious that it's not very clean. Um, they'd have to go in the morning, mid-morning, afternoon, mid-afternoon, and evening um, in order to fetch water, which is a pretty big issue. And, oh, no, we're And they also had to walk up this giant hill in order to get back to the school. And so, I guess what I'm trying to show is that identifying the problem, identifying what the community needs, that was a pretty easy part. It was pretty easy to see. Um, oh, and we've got this little tyke here, uh, who is one of our end users. <coughs> so thinking about where um, water sources need to be in order for guys like this to not have to walk, you know, five kilometers with buckets of water on their heads. Um, okay, so after we go through this problem identification stage. Um, we need to look at the water sources that the community was using um, and whether they were clean or not. And so we would take these little, um, students, we would take samples and put them in this hot bottle and mix them up with a nutrient medium and stick them on your body for 24 hours. And if it turned black, it was dirty. If it was this color, it was, uh, it was clean water. Um, and so this was really important in our um, assessment stage because the communities with clean water weren't as high of a priority as the communities with dirty water. Um, so next, we looked at the 
water committee. Um, in fact, they had a, an active water committee, and we could proceed with the next steps. Um, but if they didn't have an active water committee, then we would have to talk to the village leaders, and the village leaders would select people from each sub-village. So every village was split up into these sub-villages. Or every sub-village would elect a, uh, a representative for the water committee. So the water committee is really important um, because they helped us with all these things, um, with identifying the water demand and all the other things I'm going to talk about. So we would go around the entire village with the water committee, um, and they helped us identify the water demand first um, to see if, like, what we really need, um, what's the scale of the project that we might need to do. Uh, so this village here was really easy to figure out the water demand because they had a pump and they would turn on the pump in the morning for an hour, in the evening for an hour, and everyone had to come with their buckets and <coughs> only had an hour to fill them, so it was pretty easy to judge what the water demand was. Um, and, but most villages it wasn't this easy. So we also had to see if there was a water management system in place. Um, this same village had locks on every single spigot. Um, and in order to, like, just one person had the, the key to the spigot and they would open it for an hour a day and then had to collect like 50 or five cents for every bucket of water. And so I think what was more important um, for us like assessing the village was not if the water management system was in place, but if the water uh, money collection system was in place. So if they were already having villagers pay for water, then it was more likely to be successful in the long run because like every pump is gonna fail sometime, you know? So if they have a water like money collection system, then they're gonna be able to pay for maintenance in the future. Um, so if all of these things go well and we're like, this community is ready for a project, then we would go and do a wash training, so a water sanitation and hygiene training. Um, and in the bigger picture, these wash trainings were really to see if, if the community was ready to participate in the project. Um, so we would request if village leaders, the water committee, and village elders and important other people in the community to come for this wash training uh, for a day or two. And if they would come and they would participate, this is a good sign that we can continue with the project. But at the same time, we were also able to talk to the, to the participants of the WASH training about clean and safe water, um, how to treat their water, um, household sanitation and hygiene. And I don't know if you can see this picture here, but I'm showing them that it's important to like cage up their chickens because livestock near the, near the well site was one of the biggest um, problems of contamination. Um, we also did wash trainings with students as another form of outreach. Okay, so now if, if we're, you know, completely cool with the community, we know that this is, this is looking good, it's going to hopefully be a successful project, then we can go out um, and choose a well location at the site. So we would do this by going with the water committee and the well drillers at the same time to, to choose um, one or various well locations. So the water committee was really helpful in telling us where the water demand was. Um, they knew who needed more water and who was living where and what the most populated, what the most densely populated areas were. Um, so they could tell us that, but then the well drillers were able to assess the land to tell us um, where was an appropriate place to drill the well. Um, so I didn't really do this part. Uh, I just participated in the in the walking around the village. Um, but what I did was I would go to the village leaders um, and the leaders of each sub-village and find out if there were already um, wells drilled there. And if there were previously drilled wells, we would look at the depth of the well and the water level of the well. And I'll explain a little bit more later. But so we would go to each of the wells and use this little device called a sounder. And so you put it in the well and whenever it hits water, it beeps. So we would all call it a beeper. Um, and then you could tell what the, the water level was because there's a little ruler on it. So, um, 
So now, if we found a good well site, we're ready to go, we're going to implement the project. There are a lot of other logistical issues that we had to deal with. Um, so when you're drilling a well, it's not just a well. Um, you also, if you're using a, like a hand pump, you also need a concrete skirt and a, a drainage ditch near the well um, and the pump. And in some of the bigger projects that we worked on, St. Paul Burners, we also um, had higher capacity pumps that would pump the water up to a tank um, or to other places and distribute it from there. And so all of these um, other aspects to the well drilling projects needed community participation. And how are we going to get community participation? It's like the biggest issue in uh, our project management. So when we were working in really remote locations, we would have to have people walk with buckets of like sand and gravel and um, coarse aggregates on their heads in order to get um, the actual materials to the site. Um, and then down <coughs> here, see the, the typical Tanzanian work day of one guy working and everyone else standing by. <laughs> um, but the only way that any of this was actually possible in order to like, get all of the people out there and mobilized was for the we talked to the village leaders and um, often the church leaders in the village and they would go to the churches because um, Tanzania is a very religious place and so they would go to the churches and say, there's this big water project and it's not going to work unless you come, you know, like we really need you to come and help and everything. And so that helped a lot and I think, I think that a lot of the projects the village leaders would like bike around and call out to people, like, meet tomorrow with your hoe, <laughs> you know, we're going to have a village work day. Um, and so people actually ended up showing up in tears. Another picture of, this wasn't actually a well drilling project, but here's another example of how we were able to get um, work with one of the church leaders in the village um, to mobilize basically the entire village to come out and dig a trench. Um, so, like that relationship with the village leaders and actually the church leaders was really important. Um, and I just want to touch on the well drilling because uh, Alex is going to talk a lot more about that. <laughs> um, so, with St. Paul Partners, um, we had two different um, drilling rigs that we used. Um, so, here is a mud rotary drill. and that we just use for shallow wells. And over here is an air hammer drill, and that we use for deep wells. So the reason that we only use the mud rotary drill for shallow wells is because the company that we were working with, um, they're maxed out at 50 meters, and so we couldn't drill any deeper than that. Um, so we had this really good relationship with the company Kilo Lozar that did the mud rotary drilling, and they said, if you have a site, we'll drill there um, for like three thousand dollars or something. And if we don't hit water, we don't charge you. And so we always go with um, Kilo Will Star first. Um, but like I mentioned before, we would go around and see what the depths of each of the wells in the village were. And if we were finding that all of the all of the wells were you know, 60, 70, 100, 150 meters deep, then we have to go straight to air hammer drills. Um, and these, I think we did two projects with air hammer drills um, when I was working with them. One was 100 meters and one was 130 meters, and they were like 18 or $20,000. And so, yeah, it wasn't really feasible to do, um, to drill multiple wells when you were doing a deep well. So that's why this, it was really important to know uh, beforehand like what depth of uh, well we're going to have to drill. So um, really quick before I hand this over to Alex to talk more about mostly the mud rotary wells. Um, the most important thing that I learned while working uh, for St. Paul Partners as their project manager is that community relationships are by far the most important thing. Um, in the success of a project. 
So if I didn't have a really good relationship with the village leaders, um, all the community members, we wouldn't have gotten as much participation um, and as much ownership. And as I've been hearing, it seems like you guys know that community ownership is one of the most important things um, in the project. So, yeah. Let me hand it over to Alex. Aaron for that uh, link, kind of the foundation. So all of everything that she talked about, that's the really hard stuff. I'm just going to focus on the really technical stuff. We already found a good site to drill. We already have a community that we know is motivated and is willing to um, collaborate with us in this project. Now, um, we've already selected like, uh, that the drill is rig and everything we have is appropriate for the site, so now how to actually go about drilling this well. Um, first, though, I want to uh, go a little bit over some groundwater stuff just to the folks in the audience that might not have a hydrogeology background. Um, when I'm talking about aquifer, this is a zone where the water is filling up all the four spaces between the soil particles. There's a space underground where the soil is saturated with water. Um, and if you have larger uh, soil particles, you're going to have more pore space, and the water that is present is going to be able to flow more easily through that medium, and you're going to have a higher productive well. Um, and also having a uh, thicker deposit of that, of that portion of material, your sands, your gravels, that's also going to lead to a more productive well. So things to look for. Um, something else from the speaker. here. Um, there's a couple different kinds of aquifers. One is an unconfined aquifer, and that basically means that, like, in, in short, that water fell down on the surface, it could percolate down directly through um, to the water table and recharge it. A confined aquifer, though, is hydraulically disconnected. There's no way of it um, transmitting water to or from um, another uh, aquifer in the area. And, some, and sometimes uh, you'll have the case where one aquifer is salty and another one is fresh. You need to be very careful that when you're drilling well, you don't um, accidentally contaminate uh, the freshwater uh, aquifer with salt. So that's a really big problem that um, a lot of well drillers in developing countries might not appreciate so much, um, and that is a really difficult problem to solve. So just some general background. Um, to keep in mind as I'm going through the rest of this talk here. Um, so this is the LS100 in a box. It's um, fairly small compared to other rigs. It, can, it is possible to ship it. Um, it's capable of drilling a 100-foot hole, hence LS100, 6-inch diameter hole. Um, and it can drill through sand, soil clay, some gravel, uh, and soft rock, so not your granite or your knees or that sort of thing. Um, so it's important to have a good understanding of where your water table is, what the subsurface is like before you start drilling to make sure that um, when you do start drilling, you can, you can finish the job with, with this type of drill. Um, so this is a, just a schematic of the LS100 setup. Um, over there on the right, my right, your left, uh, is just the rig sand. Uh, and these pits over here um, hold the drilling mud. And that drilling mud is going to be circulated from this mud pit into the mud pump, down the, uh, the drill pipe, into the borehole. Um, and then it's going to carry away the cuttings that are collecting at the bottom of the borehole back up uh, through the annulus, which is just a space between the borehole and the drill pipe, um, and then back into these settling pits, let the cuttings uh, from, the, from the pit, uh, from the borehole rather, uh, to settle out, go back in the bucket, and then the process kind of starts over. Um, and you'll notice that um, in this drill bit here, there's a hole um, at the end of it, so that allows the water to, the, the drilling fluid, to travel through the drill pipe and out the end of the pit. Um, and the drilling fluid performs four pretty important uh, functions. One, it's serving to uh, cool down and lubricate the bit as it's drilling. Um, it's transporting the cuttings that are being produced by drilling um, away from the borehole and into these pits. It's also creating a sort of cake around the wall of the borehole to keep it from collapsing. That's really important um, in sands and those kinds of materials. Uh, and lastly, uh, like I mentioned just a second ago, it, uh, it prevents um, uh, aquifer contamination. So it's sealing up the wall of the borehole, so in case you are, do have to drill through one aquifer to get to a second aquifer, you don't have to worry about cross-contamination of those two aquifers. So that's a pretty um, important uh, aspect of this design. Um, so here is the LS100 um, all set up. You see the drill pipe is right here, and these are just hoses that control the delivery of water. This is going to the mud pump, or coming from the mud pump. This is going into your um, settling pits. And then that goes up there, uh, directs it from the mud pump into uh, the drill pipe. Um, I mentioned the drilling fluid, not really what it's, um, how you make it. Um, the primary ingredient most of the time is a uh, type of clay called bentonite. Um, and that just is an additive uh, 
that swells me added to water. Um, there are other additives that are out there um, that come a lot of times from the oil uh, industry. Uh, we use uh, a additive called Quick Troll Gold, which is serves the same kind of purpose as, as bentonite. Um, and when you're mixing this drilling fluid, it's really important that it has the right level of consistency, the right level of viscosity. If it's too thin, it's not going to transport the cuttings from the borehole. If it's too thick, it's not going to let the cuttings settle out, and then you just end up recirculating those cuttings out of the borehole into sealing pits, back into the borehole, and you don't really get anywhere. Um, so one way of testing the viscosity of the drilling fluid is you fill up this funnel with your mud, you have a cup underneath it, and you time how long it takes for that cup to fill up, and you're shooting for roughly about 35 seconds, give or take, and that ensures the right level of, of viscosity um, to do the job that you're, that you're trying to do. Um, so here we are mixing up the, uh, the drilling fluid. This is a venturi meter. Um, the way that works is you have water flowing out at high velocity uh, through this pipe, and those high velocities create suction, and so when you pour the bentonite in there, it gets mixed in very rapidly with the water, um, and so you just kind of circulate that through in a closed system until you reach that um, level of viscosity that you're looking for, and then you can start drilling. And you need quite a bit of this drilling fluid before you can start. We filled up probably a couple of 50 gallon drums, and that might seem kind of strange, like, well, if I had all this water, I wouldn't need to drill, because I have that piece of water. So um, it's kind of a catch-22 in some cases. You need to be um, you know, considerate of how you're going to access the water that you need to be able to drill and get more water. Um, and ironically, some of the best times to drill for water is during the dry season, where there's the least amount of water available. So um, things like that, that can be um, kind of tricky to navigate. Um, here's another picture of the setup that shows the, um, the relative location of the uh, settling pits. So basically you have the drilling mud coming out from the borehole into this channel, into the settling pit where the cuttings drop out, and then drilling uh, fluid goes into the secondary pit over here, pumped out to the mud pump, and then back uh, down the drill pipe into the borehole. So that's um, another picture of the setup. Um, and so as you're drilling, eventually, the first pipe that you use is only like five or six feet long. You're going to run out of that pipe, and it's important to add a second pipe so you can keep on drilling. So that process is called breaking pipe, and here's a video of that. Here's a video of that. <laughs> there you go. Um, so he's already disconnected um, this first pipe here from this piece called the quill, and you can see there's a slip here that's holding that, that pipe in place. Um, as you might experience, um, all boreholes are magnetic, so all metal objects are instantly drawn towards them, so you have to be careful of that. Um, so now he's uh, attached the second uh, drill pipe here, so you can continue drilling, and she's lowering the, uh, the pull there to attach it, and as soon as that is um, attached, then you can pull up the slip, and then you're good to keep on drilling. That's just one aspect of the operation. Um, another aspect, while you are drilling, it's important to be continually monitoring the cuttings that are coming out from the borehole, just to see what kind of material you're drilling through. So it's important to have someone, every couple of feet, take a screen or a sieve um, at this outlet right here and just kind of see what kind of material is coming out. Um, and so you can make a uh, pretty nice um, kind of cross-section of the ge different geological materials that you're drilling through, um, so you can find those um, those lenses of uh, sand and gravel that you're looking for to place your well. Um, so these is a picture of all the different soil samples that we collected during that day, and then later that night we put them all out in this long table, and we're able to see, okay, this is the section we want to drill. It's about seven meters thick, say, of, of uh, sand and gravel, and that's where we want to put our screen. So we went back the next day, we knew exactly at what depth we had to drill to place that screen, how long that, that screen needed to be. Um, so this, the first hole had been just a four inch diameter um, pipe, a uh, four inch diameter bit, and then the second day went back with a reamer bit, a six inch uh, bit, to go and make that uh, hole uh, larger. We knew exactly how, how deep we needed to go um, in order to place the casing. Um, this is the casing, this four inch PVC pipe. Uh, you can see this piece right here, if you can see it or no, um, has very thin uh, slots, and that's going to be the screen for the casing. It's going to allow water to flow in through those coarse particles, the sand and the gravel, into the casing, and then be pumped up. And that's just um, prefabricated, I think, from Lowe's or someplace. Um, so it's another issue, like in developing countries, you're probably not going to have a Lowe's on the street. <laughs> you need to um, be creative. Um, here's a cross section of 
out the wall with, uh, with the casing. So here's the, here's the screen, and around here is a gravel pack. And that gravel pack um, basically acts as a filter to keep fine sediments from clogging up the screen um, and just improves the overall um, production capability of the well. This is a zoomed in picture of the, of the case. You can kind of see the gravel pack that we put down there just kind of scattered around it. Um, pretty small stock on the order of a couple millimeters, but that's sufficient for the, for the gravel pack. Um, and so once we have that gravel pack in place, it's important for us to develop the well, and that development is important for two main reasons. Um, it's for improving the flow rate around the screen so you don't get um, a lot of fine particles uh, trapped in the gravel pack, trapped in the well screen so you um, can maximize the productivity of the well. And also you want to get that stuff out of there so you don't end up uh, pumping sand because that sand is going to wear down your pump very, very quickly and after a week it's going to be shot and you have to get a new pump. Um, so, not ideal. Uh, there's a couple of different steps involved in well development. Um, well, for, first of all, this is, this is a baler and the uh, bottom of that is just a check valve, so water can go in, but it can't go out. Um, so there's three steps with uh, well development. The first one is surging, uh, which just forces uh, water out uh, from the screen through the gravel pack and helps create those preferential flow pathways to improve the productivity um, of, the, of the gravel pack in the screen. Scouring helps remove sediment that's collected below the screen, and then bailing removes the water in the casing, that contaminated um, sediment-rich water, and allows more water to flow into the casing um, here is a video. Here is a video. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, so he is uh, searching right now, and so this baler is full. Sorry, that, this baler is full of water, and he's just raising it up to the top of the casing and then letting it drop. And every time that impacts the uh, water table, that's forcing water out uh, through the screen, through the gravel pack, and helping to. Um, get rid of those, those sediments and uh, finer particles. Um, and that's a picture of what we uh, ended up with at the end of, um, of our well development. So a lot of, lot of sediment um, still left there for us to get rid of. And it would have taken us about four days just to do manual um, well development, development the way we were doing it. Um, so a pretty, pretty labor intensive process um, for that. Um, for the purposes um, of this course that I was involved with, um, they didn't need another pump, and they actually wanted us to have experience with abandonment of a well. So after um, after we had installed the pump, which is uh, located right here, and just kind of saw how that works, uh, we ended up removing <coughs> the casing um, like that, and then we started uh, to put the sanitary seal, the grout, um, in the borehole in place of that um, of that casing, and. So right here, the formation stabilizer and the sanitary seal, that's what's going to go in place um, of that case that we just removed. And the reason that is important is it keeps the borehole from becoming a preferential pathway for contaminated surface water from getting into your well. Um, there was a case in Mexico of a guy who had uh, drilled a well, it was at the base of a, of, a, of a hill, and on one side there was like a pig farm, on the other side of the this, of this slope there was a cattle farm, and so Every rain event, a lot of that waste would be directed right towards that well. And what was even worse was that it was gravel packed all the way to the surface. So that gravel pack had a, had a much higher infiltration rate uh, than the surrounding area. So all that water is being funneled right down into the borehole and taken up into the screen and then pumped out. And people are drinking that. So not the best um, way of going about that. And that's why it's important to have a sanitary seal generally made of, uh, of cement um, with some bentonite in there it'll expand and fill, fill up any, any spaces to keep out um, that contaminated surface water from um, getting into the well. Um, this picture, we're just mixing up some cement that we're going to pump down. And then that's me using a diaphragm pump to deliver the, the cement uh, down the hole. So that's the quick uh, overview of how to drill with the LS100 mud rotary drill. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about manual well drilling. Um, there's a couple different methods um, for that. One is using an auger. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so an auger is a pretty straightforward design. Um, basically, how it works is you just uh, hold it up upright, um, put some force on it, and you just uh, turn the auger, and it'll cut away that soil, and it'll collect in the kind of tin can shaped thing at the bottom.
bottom there. Um, when it's full, you remove it, empty it out, and keep going. Um, and what's important to notice about this design is that the shaft is square, and that helps uh, distribute the force that's being applied on the shaft evenly among the four corners, and just makes it a more durable uh, design. I have another video of some folks using the auger just to get a sense of it, because I don't want Aaron to tear up the carpet. Um, <laughs> So it's important when you're using the auger um, to somehow keep it uh, keep it stable um, and keep it uh, upright so you don't drill a crooked hole because that would not be very useful. The other are pretending that that she's a motor and something rubbed up. Um, so keep on um, keep on using the auger until that's uh, full of sediment, emptied out, and you keep on drilling. And one advantage this has over the LS100 is. You know exactly what sediment you're drilling into uh, when you get into it. With the LS100, there's a sort of lag between um, the bit uh, clearing away some of the cuttings and it actually being transported to the top of the borehole. So you're not sure exactly what you're going through, what kind of material you're going through at a given time. And that's one advantage that the auger has. Um, another, uh, another option is percussion drilling. Uh, and this is just a percussion bit heavy, long piece of metal uh, that has uh, some kind of teeth made out of leaf springs. And leaf springs are pretty common in cars, uh, so if there's a junkyard or something around, they might have some leaf springs that you can use to um, make those teeth out of. Um, this is the baler that you use for that. Um, also pretty heavy, it has similar kind of check valve, more like a flap, um, that allows the mud uh, slurry to kind of get into the baler but not let it out. And so after using the percussion um, bit a few times, you chew up the, the soil enough, add some water, mix it into a slurry, use the baler um, to fill it up, and then, and then pick it out. Um, here's another video, last one, um, of some people in Burkina Faso uh, drilling. And they actually have a motorized winch over here, which makes it a lot easier, um, because these pieces are, are pretty heavy. Um, and so the piece he's using right now was a baler, and so they're going to Take it out and uh, clear out the dirt from that, and then they're going to switch to the percussion bit. And this guy in the background is actually going to take some water and pour it into the hole to help help the uh, help the dirt become more of a slurry and make it easier for uh, for the percussion bit to do its job. So, so he's got the percussion bit switched over, sending it back down the hole, and then he's keep on going, keep on going, uh, switching out between the percussion bit. And the baler, um, and then once you've you, once you've drilled to your desired depth, then you can install your casing and your gravel pack and everything else, and kind of proceed as normal. Um, so, um, yeah, that was quick. Um, and real quick, I didn't really explain this, but uh, I didn't uh, learn all this stuff in Tanzania or something. But I went to the exotic land of North Carolina. They have a lot of hunch puppies there, which I love. Um, <laughs> and I was learning a group called the Cook International that has a lot of these kinds of courses. So I was there for about a week. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you to the DAD Center for helping me to uh, go to this course and learn all about it. Um, so yeah, open up the questions, Sarah. Um, it's more directed to Aaron. Um, when you were testing the water and you said you just kind of add the thing and then you put it on, on yourself, like, is it for the motion or the heat for it oh, to it's see? It's for, for incubation. Okay. Um, so it's, uh, I don't know exactly what you're adding to it. I probably should have known that before I did it. <laughs> it's, I think it's just some sort of um, nutrient broth kind of mixture, um, which you mix with a sample, keep it incubated. Um, kind of similar to the Petri films that everyone else is using, but it's just a longer period of time that you're incubating, so you have to sleep with it. It's only 12 hours or six hours? Depends on which plates you're using, but it's beginning right between 14 and 14. So, never mind. <laughs> Same period of time. For your turn for a cold? Um, so that one is just total coliforms. Um, yeah. And it, it's, we used it because you're really supposed to be refrigerating or freezing those uh, petri films, like we saw in the other presentations. Um, and we didn't have a refrigerator or a freezer, and so this is one that we could do in the field. You mentioned needing to know the level of the water before you drill mm -hmm. into a new well. How do you, if you don't have any wells, how do you figure that out? So if there are no wells in the area, <coughs> I'm just kind of a good side note. Um, that's not my expertise. 
Yeah, what, what, I, what I learned is if there aren't any walls like in like a couple kilometers, like don't drill. There's probably a reason people haven't drilled yeah. before. Okay. So That's yeah. Then, true. Yeah. So try as much as you can to get like any geological information about the area and then if you don't mind spending a lot of money on possibly build wells, then go for it. But yeah. um yeah, if you're having resources. No one has filled that area there, there's a reason don't have to worry about it. Do the easy ones first. So <laughs> With the auger and the percussion methods, how deep of wells can you drill? Um, that varies. I think the auger one, I think I heard it be like 30 or 40 feet in a day. And actually with the percussion method, I forgot to mention this, it's possible to um, incorporate that along with the LS100 or LS200. There's a fellow in Uganda, he used the LS200 can drill 200 feet instead of 100. He got to about 180 feet, ran into something really, really tough that he couldn't get through with the, with the mud rotary drill. So it took out the, the drill pipe and then set up the um, percussion rig over it and drilled through a couple feet of that really hard rock, whatever it was, and then switched back to the mud rotary and kept on drilling. Um, so as far as like doing that only, that would take an awful long time. And I mean, not, he definitely did a few projects where it just was um, percussion rig. Um, I would say, If I had to guess, I'd probably get upper, upper, upper limit of like 100 feet for some of those. But don't quote me on that. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned like upwards of eighteen to $20,000. Where does that money come from? That's a great question. <laughs> um, so there's different types of drilling methods. Um, and then most of the time, the village would contribute with like, labor and materials. <coughs> but as a general rule, in Peace Corps, we talk about uh, having villages <coughs> contribute 20 or 30% of the, uh, the cost of a project through like, labor, food, and you know, materials and time. But for these really expensive deep wells, it's, it's not possible. So, I'm going to contribute as much as, as, much as they can. Um, this would remind me of um, Donald Morrison's research and, okay. and um, what he found is some NGO came through and dug or drilled all these, like I think it was like a 40 meter borehole um, all over the country. And in most places it worked fine in his particular community. Um, that 40 meter depth, that that's what it was, um, had some contamination. I can't remember, some kind of metals, I think, in the water that you wouldn't want to consume on a regular basis. Um, <clears throat> and the shallower wells have, didn't, but of course they had the other kinds of contaminations or open wells. But how, how do you, you know, can you, I guess, <laughs> know if you're going to hit something like that um, at a certain depth in a certain area where you're going to have? some kind of metal contamination or something, you know, where it's not not really water that you use because you end up like they're not they're not using it at horrible mm -hmm. because they don't want to drink it. Yeah. Um, but is there some method that, that, that you might use to evaluate that or is it kind of like too bad? Yeah, I mean <laughs> as, as far as like knowing like what kind of contaminants are gonna be in the certain aquifer before you drill into that. Um, I mean I, I wouldn't rely as much as you can on like the ministries in the country, like, if, like what kind of drilling logs they have there because there's a lot of information out there like that. Um, and kind of, yeah, look for clues in, in that to try and, um, you know, uh, try, and, try and see like if that's gonna be an issue. But as far as like knowing ahead of time what that's gonna be like, I, I really don't know. Yeah. So but I think there, there is a lot of information out there. You just have to um, feel into the report and be deep. As far as like contaminants and stuff, um, I'm really sure. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Everything is crystal clear. No doubt. <laughs>